So, welcome. I know we Welcome, Paige. Hey, hello. All right. Woo! Come on. I didn't realize you had I know. Thanks. I'm on Karen Harrington. <laughs> Thank you very much, Karen. So, welcome back. It's so nice to see so many familiar faces. Many of you were at our January 14th event where we were looking at literacy and the FURLA, which is the, uh, which is the assessment that we use for reading in the Kent School District. I hope that all of you got the email that I sent with the video that was taken, so that if you ever want to relive that experience, you can do it. The only thing that's not in there is the video that um, Stephanie showed, because it is a proprietary video for the, the company that owns the FURLA. So I, we could include that, I'm sorry, but you have the content of the PowerPoint. So we're just so glad to see you all here. We know we'll have a few people that are coming in late, so they'll be filling in these seats. And I um, hope you're enjoying your dinner. We got a little bit more this time. I, we were just at the right amount last time, and I thought, I, I always like to have a little extra. So She takes it home. Yeah, <laughs> I do. No. Uh, anyway, so we have a really fun evening for you with um, some very special folks. But before I proceed, I want to make sure to remind you that we have Al Alice Humphrey, myself, and she's our coordinator of early learning. I'm the director of early learning. And then our guest speakers this evening are Carly Wyatt. at the central office. We deploy her out to buildings to do professional development. In the trenches. Uh, session. Yeah, in the trenches with the teachers. And then we have Ms. L. Lawson, who is an actual field <laughs> teacher in yeah. our building. So, and then um, we're just very excited to have them here. They have worked so hard on this and just taken it and run with it. So we're very excited about that. Um, in the room, I know that we have, just a quick raise of hands, kindergarten teachers. Thank you. And we have some uh, KSD preschool teachers. Mm -hmm. And then we have some preschool providers from the community. And family support specialists and, and the ECAP directors. And who am I missing? Am I missing any group? Did I? Miss Dino. She's our school improvement officer. She's there at the back. Uh, thank you. Sandra Murray, who is here observing. And she is um, also an a, a instructional specialist and leader in our district. So anyway, woo! Um, and we have some children over there. <laughs> That's why we're here, right? It came with Teresa, the whole reason that we're here. So um, I am going to just very briefly mention something, and, and then I'm going to turn it over to Alice, who's going to do a little icebreaker, and then the gals are going to launch straight into their content. So um, I think. I think you all know that in Washington State we do an entry assessment for kindergarten students. It is often referred to as WAH Kids. It is actually officially called Teaching Strategy Goal. And in that entry assessment, the kindergarten teachers spend about six weeks assessing kids in six areas. Social, emotional, physical, language, cognitive, literacy, and mathematics. And then that gives us a sense of what the readiness is of our kindergarten students. And what I will tell you is that the data over every year that we've given this assessment shows that math is the lowest performing area. It is the lowest readiness area across the board, across the state, and within our own district. Our district rep reflects the same data as the, as the state. And so a focus on math is so important. The literacy scores are increasing every year. That's good. We do a really good job as a community, as a state, with literacy. We can always do better, but it's definitely much better than math, which is why we really felt like bringing some math to you is really important. So what you got when you walked in was you, you got this little handout. And this is just a photocopy. It's just a card. It's not a card. That's OK. It is the Walk Kids Progression of Development and Learning. Because I wanted everybody in the room to see the six dimensions that are assessed on the Walk Kids <coughs> and the objectives within each of those. Just for tonight, I'm going to have you focus in on the math, which is in the upper left-hand corner. So on the front page, mathematics. There are two um, <coughs> domains within there, and within there, there are objectives. So there's, there's, and we assess the kids on these. 20 is uses number concepts and operations. Counts, quantifies, connects numerals with their quantities. So that, that's an area where we assess kids. 
Are they, what, what age, what developmental level are they reflecting to us when they come? And then 21, explores and describes spatial relationships and shapes, understands shapes. So those are the areas that we assess kids. So if as a preschool provider, you're thinking, how, how can I prepare my kids? These are the areas that we are really focused in on um, for this kindergarten readiness assessment. And if you go into the packet, only I'm just going to have you look at the first page, objective 20, uses number operations, and number concepts and operations. What I want you to see is this, this table um, addresses counting. And you'll see on the left-hand side, it says not yet. And then it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This is the developmental progression that a child would go through as they learn that skill of counting. So you can apply this to any child in your care uh, and, and look at, okay, where are they? Is this child at, at showing me a developmental level of two? Verbally counts, not in the correct order, says one to ten. That's, that will tell you where that child is developmentally. We're looking for kids who show readiness in kindergarten. They're going to be at that four or five. Okay? They don't have to be at perfectly five. We expect that kids are going to be somewhere in the middle. So you can use this to take back to your program and look at all your kids and see, where are they? Where are they on this continuum? And it gives you some ideas of what they should be able to do. And then that, from that, you can derive some ideas of what you can do to help them get there. So I hope that this is a helpful tool just to make transparent the, the assessment that we use. And I know that we can spend more time on that at another time. And can I just see a show of hands who is familiar with TO School? OK, and are those people that raise their hand who, who actually uses it and implements it in their classroom with kids? I missed your question. I'm talking. That's OK. Who is familiar with this TS School block? And who, okay, who has never heard of this before? OK. OK. And that, so on your feedback sheets, you could say, gosh, I'd love to have a session on this. And we're happy to accommodate you because we're all, we want your feedback about what kind of sessions we're going to build for next year. So with that said, um, I am going to turn this over to Alice to do a quick little icebreaker with you, and then the ladies are going to start. So they're just rearing to go. They are. And I will not oh, take up too much time, but well, I'm glad you're all here tonight. We're thrilled to have you um, for the second um, session that we've been able to offer on this collaborative uh, partner event. Uh, Paige just spoke about feedback, and last time, all of you that attended our first session around literacy provided feedback for us, and I want to share some of the things. Obviously, I can't share all the wealth of information that you shared with us, but I wanted to share some of the things that we heard and read and that we hope to use in our future plan. Things that some people learned <coughs> last time were around, um, I think this is probably our district's folks, learning what preschool teachers do to teach literacy. So that was a good common conversation that we had last time. Also something that was learned was the use of the dots and the connection to the one-to-one -one correspondence. And that was um, shared throughout all of our feedback. Um, some things people wanted to go back and try were using the dots for reading and to support their, their children and their students in their program uh, in that reading strategy. Also, use of pictures in reading was something that other people shared was a valuable thing that they wanted to take back and try. So we're really pleased that you were able to take something and practice it. There were some wonderings. So what questions do preschool providers have for the kindergarten teachers? And so we didn't have as much time to have conversations about that last time. We plan to build that in as we develop these relationships between our kindergarten teachers and our pre-K providers so that we can continue to have those collaborative conversations and learn from each other. Uh, one more question, where are parents included in all of this literacy and this teaching? And that's a great question. And um, that leads us into topics of interest that we want to learn about. And one of those topics of interest is, of course, parent involvement. Um, so that's something that we can continue to look at together on how parents are involved in answering those questions and then also deepening that involvement. Other topics of interest are the social development and behavioral support that we provide for kids or that any of us provide for kids, as well as, um, I love this one, and we'll do our best to meet this, any and all collaborative opportunities with early learning providers and kindergarten teachers. So we'll do our best to meet that. That's really big, and we'll do our best. 
Um, Paige and I are already hoping uh, to have one more session this year, and she'll share more about that at the end of our session tonight, as well as we're beginning to use this feedback to help us plan for sessions next year. So we're hoping to continue this. Um, we're pleased that you're here tonight because that tells us that um, we're on the right track of creating a, a collaborative conversation where we're all learning. So we appreciate that. To get us in the math mood, we were all given a math word. And what I'd love for you to do is on your think sheet, it looks very similar to last time if you were here, but it's this page right here. And I want you to just take a minute and think about math in your setting, whatever your role might be with children and teaching math. Think about that for a moment. And you can think about that in relation to your word as well. Is that word something that might come up in the vocabulary that you're teaching with your students? Just maybe it's not, maybe it's a really high level vocabulary word that you haven't thought about teaching. But think about these three aspects, so mathematical practices, math talk, and use of manipulatives. And just think about that in your program. You can connect it to the word. If not, we're going to use the words in just a minute as well. So take some time for yourself and just write. What, what math do I have going on for my students? Right, as I'm gauging that many of you have some ideas down, you've had an opportunity to think. I'm going to, once again, challenge you to um, look across the room and make eye contact with another person. When you get up to share with this person, share your math word. They'll share their math word. And then share an idea or two that are, are happening around math instruction and math learning for kids in your program or your influence. So take um, a minute, find somebody new around the room, make some eye contact. Go to meet them, and we'll, we'll take probably take time to just meet one new friend tonight. We have a lot of content we want to share. So go ahead. As I was listening to conversations around the room, uh, people having conversations about what's happening for children in their programs. Thank you for taking that step to reach out and meet somebody new tonight. That is the spirit of the event. Um, as we are getting to transition to the main content of the night, um, I want to make sure one, somebody lost their ticket. This could be the winner.
So if you have kids, or you like kids, or you want to know more about what kids do in Kent, that's where to go. I think it's like 6 to 8 o'clock or something. 6 to 9. Okay. Yeah. So, and if you're just looking for something cool to do on Friday night, show where. Okay, and then um, I want to clarify that I left two dimensions off when I was talking about what TS Gold. And uh, so, um, thank you, Tracy, for uh, telling me that. They must have not made it onto the copy. And they are comparing and measuring. Oh my goodness, we also assess kids on comparing and measuring. And then demonstrating knowledge of patterns. So, clearly, I'm going to have to send you those in an email as a follow up. So. And then, as Alice said, we are planning a May session. We're trying to decide the date right now. Um, I have a couple in mind. I have to see if my specialist is available. And we're thinking about focusing on science. On what? Science. Science. Yeah, really cool. So with that said, I would like to turn it over to our, our rock stars of the evening after we draw <laughs> the tickets. <laughs> two, we'll do two, and then Alice will hand out the, the thing. There's her hand. Okay, so here's the <laughs>
So that's cardinality. Um, and then we have direct modeling. So when thinking like, now I can count, I can count correctly, I know how many, and I can stop when I get there, if I'm gonna direct model a number. So I put a picture here um, that shows that really well. So three plus two. So I count out three, I count out two, and then all together I can go one, two, three, four, five. There's five. So I directly modeling, and direct modeling means each thing in that has a representation. So there's one for one. Um, and uh, that's counting all, and that's really preschool area right there, counting all. We're not, and counting on is that next step which they kind of get to in kindergarten, and they, maybe they do get to it in preschool, is I'm gonna count out three objects, and then two objects, but then when I figure out how many there are, I'm gonna go, okay, there's three, and four, five. Like, so starting at the, a number instead of counting them all again. I put supertizing at the bottom because it doesn't really fall in my evolution of math because it falls in a couple of areas. Because um, uh, that uh, perceptual uh, subitizing can kind of go before anything with numbers. It's like one of, it's a really basic thing that even like a two year old can do. So if I have, for example, I'll use uh, my kids as an example. If I have three cookies in my hand and I gave my son one, he would know that I had more, right? Because he saw them. He wouldn't know there's three. He doesn't know the number three. Um, and even like dogs do this, right? You see the YouTube videos, look, my dog can count. Like, no, they actually just kind of have a little bit of subitizing going on. Um, so knowing something is there just by looking at it. Like if I showed my uh, little boy a picture of three stars and I asked him to draw them, I said, just, just draw this. He would probably draw three of them and not actually know that it was three in any way, shape, or form other than he knows what three is. Most people can't do it over five unless it's in specific patterns like dominoes, like some people memorize like orders of dominoes and things like that. Which then leads into um, conceptual uh, subitizing, which is when I do eventually realize four, and like say I see a domino and I see four on one side, and my mind does see that there's two, and there's four and there's four, so that's two groups of four, so that's eight. So that's a little bit, um, so if you read research, it actually argues a bit as to where subitizing fits, and it's because of those two reasons. Sorry, I'm going to talk at you a lot, but I will attempt to engage you as well. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about uh, the early learning pathways in numeracy, addressing early learning skills from OSPI. Um, and it has, uh, and that was, uh, I think, Paige, uh, how did you guys grab it on the way in? Yes? Yeah, it's in color, so you know it's important. Those were the, the rules of copying. <laughs> yes, thanks, Elle. <laughs> um, so under that are a few uh, categories, and these are our domains of Common Core that uh, Washington State has adopted for its math standards. <laughs> and uh, I already talked about counting and cardinality, so I don't need to say that one again. Um, numbers and operations, you'll see there's nothing uh, before uh, numbers and operations base 10 slash fractions. There's nothing before kindergarten because there, there, there is no 10 before kindergarten really. Like, and even in kindergarten it's 10s and 1s to make teen numbers. Teen numbers are 10s and some more 1s. Uh, in preschool there's no numbers and operations base 10 because we really just want them dealing with those 1s. Uh, but you can still note on there what happens after that. <laughs> Uh, operations and algebraic thinking is your idea of like putting things together, that counting on, counting all, addition, subtraction, things like that. Measurement data, which is what it sounds like, like measuring graphs, look at this graph, weather graphs, things like that, and geometry, right? Shapes, and then later on, <coughs> way more exciting things. Um, so that's kind of what they, uh, what those domains all kind of talk about, and you kind of figure, look at that when you're reading through them. Because I want you to take about five minutes. Um, to read through, um, and I'm, we're going to focus on the four to five years section in each domain, just because it is a large document, and thinking about where we're putting kids, getting them ready into kindergarten is that four to five range. We're really making that push for readiness. And uh, just kind of highlight any like ahas that you see, or, and circle any like questions you might have. Go ahead and take a... Carly, can I say one thing? No. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm working with this one. So if you go to counting and cardinality, which is your first graph, and I see you there, you will see that like 
the walk kids document that I gave you, the TS goal, this is broken down by ages, 0 to 36, 3 to 4, 4 to 5, and 5. And then, so what I want you to do is just look across the document, and you'll see that first it tells you what counting is, and then there's a column that has the letters E, L, G on top, and then next to that is goal. Okay. So does, does anybody know what ELG stands for? Except her. <laughs> you do? What is it? Early Learning Guidelines. Okay. So Early Learning Guidelines, that is a document that was put together by the, well, I don't know what it was put together. It, it, it's on the Department of Early Learning website. And the Early Learning Guidelines are like the Common Core State Standards, if you will, for early learning providers. And if you don't know what that document is, when I send my post-event email out, I will send you a link to that document. Because that document is the precursor to our Common Core. Like, that's, that addresses the 0 to 5 space. Then we have Common Core that addresses the 5 to 21 space. Okay, so some of you are looking at me like, what are you talking about? When you see the email and have a chance to look at that document, it will make a little more sense. And based on your feedback, we'll know if we need to talk more about that in a future session. Now, the next column is goal. Walk it, it's TS goal. That's the assessment I was just talking about. So what this document does is it aligns standards, Common Core State standards, to the early learning guidelines and to goal. So we're showing how all these documents are connected. Okay, thank you. <laughs> that was more than one thing. Yes, right. <laughs> you are so right. So, and now you are going through and yeah, doing look, Yeah, go ahead and take a look at that three through five uh, section in each uh, domain. Okay, can I call everybody back? <laughs> I'm wondering if there's anything uh, that anybody wanted to share out or a big like aha uh -huh, that they worked out at their table or questions or anything that they had. For me, this was helpful because I have some students who are coming in so, so low. Oh, that's what it's called. And, you know, the where classes, we kind of start at a point. But if they don't have all of these earlier skills, they are so to be able to get the later skills. So it gives me a good idea of, you know, if this child cannot count one to one correspondent, what do I need to back up to do to help them get to that Kind of like that so math evolution she was talking about is knowing what comes before and having it all on one document is yeah. nice. Well, all together. Yeah. And I shared that I have a lot of non-English speaking parents and grandparents too, and I think everybody's so focused on the literacy piece um, that they know their ABCs and they recognize the words and some side words and things like that. That that math does get lost. You know, oh well, they can't speak English and they're here, but we've also got to incorporate that other piece too and make. Oh, yeah, that idea of like, we can't do anything else until we get these down. Right. Like, not, it's it's got to be at the same time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, we have an interesting conversation here about kind of a, an aha or kind of a notice you want to share. Stuff. Sure. I was just looking at um, the algebraic thinking. Um, how do kids, um, kids at three and four are understanding that it doesn't matter if it's three plus five or five plus three? And the word is intuitively, I'm like, wow, when did I even, I mean, were we taught that? Did it just happen? And then you shared maybe in order to kind of explain that to kids, you have two different colors of, of manipulatives. So you might have three red and two green. And does it matter if we count the green first? Does it matter if we count the red first? So that kind of was a visual. And even the 48, that's really visual. Oh, ah, context is always yeah. powerful in understanding. <laughs> um, yeah, so just kind of like, oh my gosh, kids are supposed to be able to do this, or are they supposed to be able to do it, or it should just be a conversation we're having, like, and discovering together, is kind of a thing. Um, and now a moment with Elle. <laughs> I had her kind of flip through this um, as thinking of it through, through a kindergarten lens and think about, like, what would you just, like, be so happy if your kindergartners came in wrapped in a nice bow having? <laughs> with this big document, right? <laughs> well, she, she, I would like everything. Yeah, I'd do everything. That'd be great. <laughs> no, I sat down with a couple of kindergarten teachers and a couple of preschool teachers and kind of asked them, okay, this is a big document. What are our non-negotiables? What do we have to have? Like, what do we have to have these kids knowing when they come in? So if you want to look, um, I kind of picked one thing from each section. If you want to look with me, maybe highlight it as you go. 
The uh, first section for counting in cardinality, um, we talked about knowing to be able to count five objects and to also have that one-to-one. -one. So knowing that one-to-one -one correspondence, it helps across the board, even in literacy, knowing that one-to-one -one and just touching objects. Um, I have a lot of non-English speaking students when they come in. Um, and we really practiced, it didn't matter what word they were saying, it didn't matter what number they were saying, as long as they were touching each one as they were doing it. And so that was kind of our non-negotiable. Um, another one was the verbally counting to 10. And that also, um, so we can really get that foundation. So then we can move forward of 10 and some more. So they can verbally count to it, they have some base in it. We don't have anything for numbers and operations for preschool, yay, right? <laughs> <laughs> all of that base 10. It gives you one thing you can check off your list. Um, for operations and algebraic thinking, um, we were talking about that more or less. Um, with that visual, it would be perfect having two different counters and knowing we have more, we have less. <coughs> we're getting that vocabulary with them. If you want to flip to measurement and data. So that was, um, for measurement and data, we were talking about longer, shorter, <coughs> taller, any of that vocabulary they can describe. So what, having them describe, oh, this one is taller, or it's longer, or shorter, smaller, getting you those different vocabulary. And for geometry, we uh, talked a lot about <coughs> shapes. Um, one of the, um, Shapes, uh, we thought was interesting, is making shape creation. So first off, they're familiar with the shapes. Um, I know one of um, several of my teachers, I had a conversation about a rhombus and how that was not a diamond. And so we were looking on vocabulary and getting rid of kind of the <coughs> common words in more of our mathematical terms, and we can teach it right from the beginning, this they know it as a rhombus. So knowing the proper names for the shapes, and then having fun with it, making <coughs> shapes out of it, or making, creating pictures with those shapes. So knowing those shapes. Not bad, right? That's all that I know. <laughs> yes, no, right? Not too bad? <laughs> Any questions or comments? Or anything I'm clear about? My non-negotiable? <laughs> um, did you say you wanted them drawing in shapes? Um, and just recognizing the shape. Oh, and then using those shapes. shapes. <laughs> I think it was just a pattern box and kind of making creations with them and things like that. So maybe not as much drawing them, but kind of knowing the attributes of them. Good question. So the fine motor issues. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I kind of was like, so here's the math, right? Here's the trajectories. Like, so what? What do we do with this? Right? What do, what do we do with it? Well, we want kids exploring, discovering, reasoning, talking about all of those discoveries. Like, that's it, <laughs> right? We just, we really want kids, uh, especially in our pre-K through two grades, um, just really digging into that conceptualness of mathematics. And uh, one of the best ways we do that is through manipulatives. That's a way larger picture on the screen than it was on my computer. <laughs> uh, so, right, children should really, um, be exploring um, all math with these concrete models, expe and especially in our K through two. Like we shouldn't be doing math at all without making it out on the table. Uh, it's actually one of our math like, practices that we will uh, talk about later. Um, so why, right? Why besides the fact that it's fun and engaging uh, is also uh, because our most valuable lear learning it does occur when we construct our own knowledge. Um, with mathematics. I was lucky enough to have a geometry teacher in school who didn't just give me the algorithms, right? We actually took the square and we cut it in half and we found that we discovered what an area of a triangle was by actively doing it. We came up with it on our own and that's, that's rare. I was lucky. And uh, I will never forget any of these formulas because I came across them myself, like as an adult when people are talking, I'm like, oh, I know what that is, but boom, I, I know what it is because I've done it and I've built it. Um, <coughs> And they provide uh, opportunities for children to explore and develop and even test these ideas and, and discuss and apply those ideas. These are uh, Elle's uh, awesome kindergartners here, right? They have a, they have a worksheet out um, and they're talking about comparing numbers and adding numbers, but they have manipulated these out and they're, taught, they're in partners, like they're working together and uh, figuring this out. So how much more engaged do you think they are? <laughs> right, so we started this um, 
like this activity with just the worksheet. Uh, originally, that was kind of our plan. It was a practice review, let's try it. Um, after the kids started to develop two of them, we realized this isn't working because it doesn't work. They needed the manipulatives. So we brought out the uh, linking cues and we started working with them. Immediately, the students could build the numbers. They were no number partners. So clearly, that manipulatives were helpful there with just a simple worksheet. So question, do you use partners and, and groups very often? Yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah, Great I question. Say that. I like your thinking. What are you saying there? Uh, yeah, but yeah, all the time. Yes. Uh, and I think one of my one of my takeaways from a training that I went to with that is like you wouldn't want to be uh, operated on by a doctor who had only been told right how to do it and never had actually hands on practice. Like I would not get in on an airplane with a pilot who had read an instruction manual, right? <laughs> like I would want somebody to have hours and practice like with their hands on doing something. And it's the same with everything we do. And why? Why would we want that? You make more connections in the brain too yeah. when you're doing different things you're manipulating, you're seeing it, doing it, touching Trial and error. Yeah. Yeah, you've done, yeah, you've actually experienced it and tried it out, and now most likely that practice with it, you're, like I said, you're making those brain connections. There's tons of research. So let's do some math, right? Speaking of getting it and doing some math together, um, this is a wreck and wreck, which is. Uh, from Poland, and, uh, and uh, it's, it means rhythmic rap is uh, what, it, what it actually means, and uh, this is what it is. It's one of my uh, favorite um, uh, pre-K to um, math manipulatives. They actually have a 100 bead one um, as well, uh, if you aren't familiar with it. Uh, this is what it is, what it looks like. <coughs> um, and uh, just take a moment and take a look at it and tell me, or think privately, what something you notice about it. And when you notice one thing, you can give me a thumbs up. And if you notice another thing, I'm just asking people to privately think about it, sorry. Okay, go ahead and turn and talk to people at your table. Let them know some of the things that you notice about the rest of it. And uh, who would like to tell me something that they notice about our math tool, this record rec? Yeah. Anything you notice? Yeah, since you were at our school. Um, well, we, you start with them on the right side, right? Correct? So you're noticing that I have them on the right side? Yeah. But we can't remember why. Okay. <laughs> no, there's a reason. I'm just, asking you to, I'm just asking you to notice something right now. We'll unpack it a little more. But yeah, they're all on the right side. Yeah? There are groups of five and groups of ten. Where do you see five and ten? The colors are groups of five and the folds are groups of ten. All right. So these, this is five and this is five and this is five and this is five. And together, this is ten and this is ten. Does anyone see five or ten another way? There's ten red and ten white. So I can see ten this way, too. There's ten red. What's something else we notice about our math tool? They're round. They're round. <laughs> They're beads, yeah. Yep. Anything else? They can have the moves. Yeah, they slide on there, right? That's the best thing about this. <laughs> they stay on there. <laughs> there's two bars. Yeah, there's two bars. This is, a t this is I lovingly call a top bunk and a bottom bunk. <laughs> the top bunk and the bottom bunk? So I heard some people say five and five and ten and ten. How many do I have all together? So uh, that is unpacking a wreck and wreck, and it's something you have to do with your kids before they use them at all. Like it, you have to really unpack this tool so that they're actually functionally using it with that five, and and sometimes unpacking it more than once so that they feel that this 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 has a, a structure. A purposeful structure, um, and you asked about the the side, the the right, and we slide to the left. And so we we're like, why do you do that? Because you slide it, and we're trying to teach kids to read left to right. And uh, believe it or not, they are flexible in their thinking, children. Uh, but the, you do slide it over here, and then they usually count this way. 
So it goes over here, and then the counting does go that way. It doesn't matter which way they count, right? But for the most part, it's like answer here. There are some activities where you bring beads to the middle, like, oh, look, I have four. How do you know two and two? You know, so there are some activities in the middle, but majority of everything starts here. And did, did you have a question, or did I just answer? I just want to know how to spell it. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. There's a lot of K's, yeah. <laughs> there are. That's true. Uh, um, so I'm going to, uh, or Elle and I are going to be passing one of these out to you. And uh, we are going to do some math with it. We were trying to look at how much they cost. Oh, I think one of these is $8, and then the big giant one I have here is 20 25, yeah. They're like 88. They're really easy to make. Not that I'm telling anybody to spend their own money or yours. Oh, yeah, they are yours. You're the PK. <laughs> or PT. I made a giant red
they have concrete. <coughs> you might not be able to say five plus two, but she, looking at it, was able to explain it to them. Yeah. Is that articulated? Is that similar? I was, yeah, and just to add to that, you could tell they were really engaged, and it was really hands-on, mm -hmm. and um, they were having fun with it. Like, you could see the like, little boy that he zoomed in on, he really wanted to emphasize putting the two back. <laughs> 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 so it's like, it's fun. Yeah. It's fun. And he really wanted to explain that thinking, right? Yeah. And that, like all the different levels that those kids were at were all engaged in the same thing. Like we saw immediately that one boy just went boop, seven right away, and we saw the one, two, three. So it didn't really matter where they were at because they all had that tool there um, to support them in, in, in the different levels that they are at. Um, so now the moment of L, I guess. <laughs> so Liz's going to play L in music and have her rock. Okay. And now, I like some soft jazz music. <laughs> Kind of some things that um, working with manipulatives, um, have tos, I would say, for manipulatives is practice. Um, I know the very first thing I like to do, um, it wasn't in the video because it would have been too long, but the first couple minutes I gave them the rec marks just like you guys and play with them. They shake them, they move them, they twist them, they turn them, they flip them over, they get to explore them. So just let them have that play time. And then once we have that play time, we know that it's a math tool. So just setting it up with the student's expectation. Now we're gonna use this for math. So now we're gonna use this and think about our numbers and our thinking. So setting that expectation right away that this is a math tool that we're going to use takes away the it's a toy and we're going to play kind of part of it with it. Um, and clearly unpacking it is a good thing. Um, I unpacked it just like we did with you all, um, where it was the big thing, before we even had it here. So just practicing with those manipulatives and setting clear guidelines. Um, another thing is the start and stop, having clear start and stop. So they know the hands and eyes, their hands are no longer on the manipulatives. So they know that's their focus time. Then just the more time we practice with it, the more routine it becomes. You can see it now in January, I guess, February. <laughs> it goes pretty smoothly. Yeah, I just think that idea of like manipulatives is like, oh my gosh, it's so crazy. And it's so, like, it kind of is at first, right? It is a little crazy. Um, First, and I mean, we're talking about the rec and rec specifically right now, but just unpacking any manipulative before giving to it to kids, it kind of builds that power um, of that manipulative as a math tool. Um, and yeah. it's with the math tools also, it's giving it any entry point. So when we do this uh, rec and rec, what do you notice? Uh, there's red and white. That's a perfect answer. That's an entry point for every student. There's some red, there's some white. So then maybe if they can count them, that's good also. So just giving them any kind of entry point with this tool so it's not overwhelming. Anything they notice is a good noticing. Yeah, that's always a good question for Ethan. Equal access to equity. What do we notice? What are we thinking? Okay. About math. Yeah. <laughs> I think we did this one time, did this one time in class. I'm like, what do you notice about that? And I heard my kid go, I notice a cat. I'm like, oh, do you? <laughs> I'm like, where? Where do you notice the cat? So you notice, you know, obviously kids need to be wrong. But if they say yellow, they're talking about the wood. And if they say silver, they're gonna, like, it takes, took me a while. I'm like, oh. At first, we're yellow. We were like, uh, <laughs> to work on color words. This kid tested. <laughs> you know, I've heard the color of eyes. <laughs> um, so uh, somebody had said this before. Uh, about manipulatives, but uh, putting them in their hands uh, is, is one thing, and having them use it is another, but like really getting them talking about what they are doing with those manipulatives is kind of a really a big thing to be thinking about with our younger kids. And I think I go into some of the preschool classrooms here in Kent, and uh, you know, they're totally capable of turning and talking. This is a picture of a, of a kindergarten class. Um, one of those kids doesn't look like he's in kindergarten, but. Uh, <laughs> Why talk? Um, I just happen to have a picture of it, so I use it in the slide. Uh, so, so why why do we want students talking? Think about that for a second. Go ahead and turn and talk to people. Turn and talk about why talk. Why is talk important? Why is talk important? Why do you want kids talking to one another? Right. I hear some uh, great conversations. So who wants to talk about why talk? Who wants to tell me what they said, or maybe their neighbor said, about uh, why talk is important in school or with, with kids? They want to talk. They want to talk, right? Yeah, they do. It's hard to get them to stop sometimes. Same with adults. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it really helps to build their vocabulary and feel like our ELL students are struggling with vocabulary. We can hear what they're trying to say and then help assist them with the vocabulary itself so that they learn it and then they can start using it when they're talking. Yeah. Teaching, um, teaching the vocabulary. I don't think I could have paid, if I paid you to say that for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, those are ELL students, like, so powerful to them thinking, especially, like, when we get newcomers in, like, sitting them in a triad, even if they're not talking, they're sitting there, and, or they're pointing, or, you know, they're, they're listening, they're just getting emerged in that language, in that academic language, from their peers. So it also helps build their social skills, I believe. Yeah, how, how so? What do you think about that? What do you think about that? So that they can, um, well, just like you said, when people, children don't speak the language, they can sit next to someone and they learn to trust that person that, they're, that they understand what they're trying to say, I would think. Yeah, yeah, so, social in a lot of ways. Yeah, not just taking turns talking. Yes. Turn taking, for sure, social. But knowing that they can share what they know, they're motivated to learn more. So the motivation is going really high knowing that they're in interaction. <coughs> Yeah, you really bring that engagement up. I don't know, like in the classroom, I saw a lot of this, like, oh, oh, oh okay, I'm gonna take one more, and it's not gonna, oh, that's something so important to say to you right now. Like, and so it gives them that chance to get it out, right? Yeah, we, we do this a lot, uh, that, like, same as, you know? And that, that avoids, like, oh, too, because it, like, gives that, like, I'm thinking the same as you, not only is that exciting for me that I said something and everyone's like, yeah, yeah, I'm thinking the same. But also, it goes away from that, like, oh, they said what I was going to say. <laughs> it's like now I have something else to do instead. Like, oh, I thought that too, me too. You know, so, it's, you know, kids need that. They need to be heard. Like you said, like they want to be engaged and they want to be a part of the conversation. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Well, it's just a nice way for them to realize that there's different methods to get to the same answer. Yeah, that strategy sharing is so powerful to move our kids through those trajectories, even, even like past uh, what we talked about on cardinality and things like that, building in numbers. Like one kid's like, oh, I went up here and I know it's five because one, two, three, four, five. And the kid's like, oh, I know it's five because I knew three, four, five. It's like, whoa, like now we've just kind of exposed our kids to each other's thinking um, and kind of thinking like, wow, Josen, that's a great way of doing that. Let's let someone else let someone else try Josen's way. You know, so it's and again like that thinking, uh, a kid's thinking uh, publicly is like. They have a lot of thoughts that don't have to be regurgitated out of our mouths, right? They 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 are deep little thinkers that um, we sometimes just have to give a name to what it is. I'm like, oh, so what you're talking about is counting on, and that's pretty cool because um, it's really hard to teach if you define teach by telling um, versus like that sharing of ideas. That <laughs> have. So you guys named all these, but there's a <laughs> right. So oh, I guess the misunderstandings is one. Like you can see the students are turning and talking. And uh, that's a nice picture of Elle sitting there and actually like listening to them, right? Because when students turn and talk, sometimes one of our powers in that is like, whoa, they're all thinking something that they should not be thinking, and we, let's talk about that, right? Like, oh my gosh, they're all talking about, uh, or if I say, oh, turn and talk to your neighbor about what you're noticing about this record, I'm like, oh, I see blue, or I see, I see red, I see white, I see red, I see white. So I'm like, okay, I'll call on you, but who else thought something else? Like, I don't want to just get a bunch of colors in the conversation, so it kind of helps us direct the conversation as well. Um, uh, the memory one was new for me in reading research. It's uh, that talk about academic things is really important um, for memory because um, creating a social experience around learning logs it away to your memory. Especially if I say something and somebody agrees with me, and now I'm like, you know, like that. The socialness of learning um, and talking builds kids' memory, especially if we have a disagreement, right? And I've seen preschoolers have a disagreement, like. <laughs> I have a video of it, and I'm going to edit it and put it in one of these because it is the cutest thing. It's just like, I don't agree with you. I disagree. And he gets up there, and he's totally doing the exact same thing, but in a different way. <laughs> but, uh, and he's like, oh, sounds like you have a roundabout way of agreeing, but uh, you know, there's different ways of thinking. Uh, so that deeper reasoning um, kind of goes to, to what you shared about them, them building on each other's ideas, like and being exposed to um, each other's thinking and, and looking at things in a new way, like how we move kids from where they're at in math. We don't ever talk about where they're at in math. <laughs> so those ideas and sharing. Uh, and the language development was spoke to nicely already um, for all students, right? We, we said, we say ELL, but we also have our special education students 
um, and not actually students, but speech um, IEPs <coughs> in our classrooms that um, help support them as well. And uh, social skills, right? But overall, like, talk isn't just math, it's life, right? We all have to learn how to talk to each other, some do it better than others, but <laughs> so, we talked over here also um, that when, as you can see, like the little boy and the little girl, um, she is very little English um, speaking newcomer. So um, when um, she didn't have an idea, when her partner could help her, and then she would then have an idea to share out. So she could use his idea too. So it kind of gives them another point of access mm -hmm. to the material also. How often do you try to talk? Very often. Uh, very, I would probably say, I try to intentionally plan them in the lessons. Um, sometimes there's that teachable moment that it's right in there, um, but in kindergarten, I would say we turn and talk at least two to three times a lesson. So it's that really just, also it helps them just get their idea out too. So we're, and it helps me with my students that I can listen to a lot of students at one time without one person sharing at a time. Right, it stops the word out. Yes, it absolutely does. Um, so there is a talk trajectory, much like it's an evolution of talk. <laughs> That's my advice. I should have done music. I know, I should have. I'm sorry. Uh, I left that out of the page. Come on. <laughs> um, so, like, what do we want? Productive math talk or any talk, right? When do we want it now? But we don't have it. Maybe not yet, right? Because they're little. Um, uh, so productive talk, it doesn't just happen. Like, it's not just magic. These kids don't just turn and talk to each other and actually listen to each other and engage with each other ideas. Um, it starts with creating space and time for it. Elle just said something amazing that I maybe paid you to say, I don't know, but planning for it, right? So I'm on this lesson. When do I want kids to turn and talk? Like, when do I want them to talk about something? I, want, I need to pre-plan for it. A spontaneous turn and talk happens all the time because we can pre-plan our eyeballs out and some kid says something and it throws the lesson down another way and it's like wow okay let's go down here because this is really great or you can't you can't plan you only plan for about 75% of your lesson I think and the kids take the rest uh, take sometimes take it on a detour um, and then space right bringing kids to the carpet and, um, uh, physical space and time which is a bigger thing for the older kids you guys are really good at that but when I go into a fifth grade classroom and they're like they don't even have them they have them sitting in rows it's like well we don't really have space for talk right now um, so it's creating that is like step one, right? Intentional partners is uh, really important. Um, thinking about um, L does a great like power up partners, and they pick partners when they're on the way to the carpet. I see A, I see B, window, wall, boy, girl. But sometimes you really want to be thinking, like I had mentioned with those triads with our ELL students or our special education students, and just have them sitting amongst uh, kids that they're really um, going to be learning from. Um, and sometimes we want kids part partnered with a student that's at the same level. Sometimes we want to have them partnered with a student that is maybe above, below, or where we want them partnered. So thinking about our partners and um, how, how they uh, do that. So a physical body turn is really important with a partner talk, right? So like, <laughs> step one, right? Uh, one student talking at a time is a big deal with the little kids. Like, you know, like I think you maybe heard in the video, she's like, okay, who's gonna talk first? Like. And sometimes that's the nice part about those partners, it's like A's talks first, or Blue's talks first, or Butterflies talk first, whoever, whatever you partner your kids, um, is someone's gonna talk first and someone's gonna talk next. Um, and then that active listening to the, what that person said, right? Asking now that we have this down, now I'm gonna ask you to maybe repeat what that person said or ask a question of what that person said, which is, you know, it's, they're so caught up in their own little world. Um, that, uh, that they don't really think of it. And then when I, when I think of active listening, I definitely don't think about math, right? I think about turn and tell your partner what your favorite color is, okay? Now that person has to share with the class what your favorite, like we don't start talk with academic things. We talk, we start with kids, right? Because they, they wanna talk about themselves and what they did this weekend or what their favorite stuffed animal is, right? So talk starts um, around other things besides academic things to get kids listening to each other. Um, and then reasoning with others, right? Uh, I agree, I disagree, um, I have something I want to add on to yours, or those, those sentence stems that you kind of think of, like, I agree with so-and-so because, or I disagree with you because, and that's where that really, that memory part comes in, building those memories about what things, what things have been said. Yeah.
Can you just explain a little bit more about what you mean by sentence stem? Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I so a sentence stem, you heard um, Elle use it in her thing, and it's like, I built the number seven. So when you turn to your partner, say, I built the number seven by, and then they, they I built the number. So it's some a support for kids um, and how they're going to talk to each other. It's difficult in our pre readers without saying it um, and then getting the sign. So, okay, now, now partner B. I built the number seven by, he's like, I built the, it's just build that vocabulary for them. Um, and then thinking of our actual readers, we put them on the board, you know, as, as ways to, um, to remind them how to talk to each other. Um, I've had students come up with them now. And yeah. they go, I, I'll, I'll ask the question. I'm like, well, how do we start this? And then the students will now give me the sentence, like frames or the sentence stem. And they start out and they always do the blank because they don't want to give the answer, so they get really excited. Like, I built seven by blank. <laughs> and, then, and so then they know, okay, that's how I'm going to start it. And I always start my turn and talk with a sentence, Sam or a friend. Otherwise, they turn and talk, and then they look at their partner. And then they go, and they look at them. And then they're, they're, it's that whole turning, we forgot where we are kind of thing. So then starting that sentence frame kind of gives them their brain back onto what we're talking about. And think of, like, what a great precursor that is for writing, even though we're talking about math. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, that's great. We use those in a lot of our Yeah. Yeah. The ELA yeah. sentence stems are just it's a great books, support yes. for all kids. Anyway, yeah, to get adults. them like started talking, like yeah. knowing where the entry point of their conversation can start. Uh, so I have another. Oh wait, sorry. One more thing. These are all kind of protocols that uh, under these few, like the turn, one at a time, active listening, reasoning with others. Um, like the other stuff is kind of the teacher. These things are things that have to be taught to the kids and reinforced. Like, wow, I really like, I've actually seen some explicit instruction of like, we're gonna do a turn and talk today. Will you come sit in front of me? Like, what did you do this weekend? No, 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 it's like, oh kids, what did you notice about us? Like, wow, you guys looked at each other, you talked to each other, you listened to each other. That's like really intentional. And there's protocols around it, anger charts, posters, pictures of your kids doing it. Especially like maybe your kid that doesn't ever do it. <laughs> if you can catch that kid doing it one time, you know, and get them in a picture of like, and then it's like, oh, oh remember turning your body, you know. So it's those kind of uh, those ones are teacher supported ones that you want your kids uh, to help your kids uh, do. So now I have another video of Kent Kinder Kids in action with their tripod. Although well, you did kind of see it in the other video as well. Uh, and it is Elle again. <laughs> so the new set of children. These are yeah. not my students. So this is this is not Elle's class, which I thought was just kind of cool. Um, she uh, was uh, kind of we were practicing some stuff with the wreck and wreck and unpacking it, I think. But uh, so it's not even her class. Uh, it's just another set of kindergarten. Oh, sorry. Before I started, <laughs> think of some of the things uh, she's doing. Uh, on this trajectory to support the kids in that turn and talk. So some of the things she calls out. Yeah. So is this turn and talk something that all kindergarten teachers are doing? Yes. I think we kind of found it as like a foundation for kind of kindergarten that it's so rewarding that and it's so beneficial and so many different aspects that it's kind of like I can't live without my turn and talk. It's also, if I might say, turn and talk is a very culturally responsive practice mm -hmm. because many kids, um, either they don't have the words that they need language modeling or they're not comfortable speaking in front of a group, but they will with one of their child and letting them say, and when we get back to the share, I'll asking kids to share what their partner said instead of what they think is also a, 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 a better cultural responsive, culturally responsive practice. So yes. this was also a, um, part of our reading program before our most recent reading program. Oh yeah, the Making Meaning Making program meaning. had like a partner A partner B. Yeah, the talk research and things have been, has been around since forever. Yeah. Because as Carla was saying earlier, learning, and you guys know this from your own experience, learning is a social experience. And so the more opportunities we get for kids to do that, the better. Uh, so what are some things that we notice about the trajectory that L uh, and L didn't know I was going to be using this video for this purpose at all. This is this is a couple like four months ago when I was training teachers on on the rec and rec, and she was learning how to use it. So yeah. So I have just something that I observed, which I have in my classroom. A little boy that he put his hood on, so mm -hmm. he was totally disengaged. So um, 
with this, how does this work when you do have that child that just doesn't want to participate? How do you draw him back in? If I can show you the whole video, he does. He does, he does draw back in by uh, the sharing because we have him turn and talk again later. Um, but uh, but yeah, what, what do you do when a child disengages? I think it's just kind of like, per, like somebody could get down there and be like, so what are you noticing? You know, like, so again, just keep, maybe keep re-engaging. Yeah, re-engaging or maybe that's a kid that needs to be a part of a triad um, or, or the turn and talks to start out. Um, but yeah, I mean, there might be. I mean, there were there are a lot of adults in the room for this, as you can see. Uh, uh, but uh, it's because we were doing a training on on a wreck and wreck in the building. Yes. Uh, two things that I noticed that weren't part of the traje trajectory, but um, in both of the videos, we had a really good end of pair share time, mm -hmm. and I think that's really important to get the kids reengaged in a second. Um, however you can do that. And then when the one student said, just that student there started with, it has, you stopped her and said, I noticed that and had her reinforce that sentence. Anything else? Yeah. I just, the, the one little girl, the one, her partner turned away from her and mm -hmm. she just like kind of tapped him on the leg and he turned right back around and started right up again. Hey. That squirrel moment. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to keep them re engaged, right? To what are they doing? So, that was good. so, yeah, and like they're holding their partners responsible. Yeah. 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 I've even seen videos where kids are like, you say something now. <laughs> <laughs> kids are your turn. Yeah. You're me, go. <laughs> um, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, um, so, yeah, as you said, um, with that, um, I always power up with my partners. Love it. Um, anyway, you can group them spontaneously. Um, they've had like chicken wing partners. They call their chicken partners. Whoever's in their our elbow partner. Um, anyway, they can come up with it, engage it. Um, they like them um, with that. Um, physically, knee to knee, eye to eye. I tell the kids, and so that kind of reiterates with them. They know their knees are to each other. Their eyes are to each other. And I think I revoice that several times throughout my lesson. Turn, turn and talk to your partner, knee to knee, eye to eye, and the kids know, like that's, they're engaged then. Um, for the um, coming up with who talks first, um, at first I assigned it, and as the year moved on, the, um, now they're having that conversation, do you wanna go first, or can I go first? So then again, that conversation now has moved past the I decided who decided. So there's kind of like a trajectory there too. Yeah, the social part of it. Yeah, the social of when you can, or are you assigning it? Are they having that conversation kind of um, thing? Um, also, um, I think oh, also having um, the students being able to share their partner's ideas um, was a new thing in this lesson. Um, they were used to sharing their idea and um, they were kind of just talking at each other not really listening. So having them share their partner's idea is a more active listening kind of role for them. And when you were done, you said three, two, one. Talking is done. Talking. That was um, with this class. Um, I always do hands and eyes, and the kids go hands and eyes in the beginning, and they do it. Um, this class, their, their structure was one or three, two, one, talking is done. Anyway get their attention focused. Those protocols, yeah. Yeah, those in practice, the more practice and routines with those protocols, the easier it is to manage. Because I know when it first, we first rolled manipulatives out in, in kindergarten, it was almost overwhelming. But the more time that we practice and gradual release of responsibility, it's been amazing for the students now. So the last thing in your packet, um, which in Common Core is the first thing, um, because uh, really it is first, though well, how kids do math together. So we have these standards, we have these learning trajectories, and those are what kids need to know mathematically. And the practices are how. How should they be doing this with each other? Um, and uh, it's on that last page, and uh, these are all student behaviors, not, not teacher behaviors, which sometimes can be confused. So like selecting appropriate tools, that's a student oh, yeah. behavior. So if I have blocks out, I have base 10 out, I have the wreck and wreck out, the student's making that choice of what manipulative to use is then engaging in the mathematical practice. Um, 
So I was just uh, kind of read through them. It's that last page it's just in your learning trajectories and think about um, some areas that you may be engaged in those practices yourself today in this professional development or maybe you saw kids um, engaging in. <coughs> so who wants to share out a map practice they engaged in today or they saw students engaging in today, this evening? <laughs> Today of them happen? Were you seeing the students doing them? Were you doing them? We were doing recently abstract data quantitative so we could get the ways of showing the ways of showing number, building number. Yeah. I've done a few things before um, we got more record racks in our classroom. I made different ones for the kids to use and they enjoyed doing that. I've done it with close pins on the bottom of, of a hanger. I've done it with a pipe cleaner with two sets of different colored beads they can bring home and they feel that they can be successful at home with them that way. So they're using the tool? Yeah, yeah, but they can bring it home and if it's lost, when you have 10 pony beads and a pipe cleaner, you know, kind of thing, but they have that tool that they can still do things with. Any other ones? I know it's the end of your time, but I, I encourage you to read over those math practices because they really are the heart of what kids should be doing in math and how thinking about how I can set up my classroom to support students in their engagement of this. And Turn and Talk is definitely one of those ways to get at math, math practice three, and math battle for practice six, attending with precision, talking about language. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much for your time this evening. I know you all. Uh, are very dedicated to be here this late at night. Yeah. You didn't just come because you got fed. I'm sure you didn't have fed. Well, thank you. Thank you, Elle and Carly. And a little gift. Yay! Oh, thank oh, you. Yay. Yay. Okay. Now I feel bad for stealing all those raffle tickets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Give to your heart, Carly. Um, okay, so I want to thank you so much for being here tonight. Quick closure. Um, I know we threw a lot at you. You will get this video, and uh, you will get the PowerPoint. I will send it to you in my in my post event email. So don't worry. Um, it won't have the video though. It, the video is too large. The video is too large for me to send. I'm sorry. Um, it can bring me on the share drive. It can be shared on the share drive for internal folks and external folks. If you really want the videos, uh, we can. Yeah. Maybe they can come to my classroom. Come to the classroom. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, so I wanted to say, so turn and talk is a, is a really big deal. Like that is a practice that all of our kindergarten teachers use, and on up through our all of our grade levels. And it is not a random act. So it is something that is explicitly taught, explicitly modeled, and explicitly practiced. And um, and if you want more on those topics, please give us feedback on the feedback sheets. What do you want more of? We want to make this meaningful for you. So not only content, but also structure. How can we do better? So, um, and then as Alice is going to do some closure with some, with some goodies, I'm going to put the early learning uh, website up for you to see. So I have a completely updated early learning website. And on that site, there's everything you want to know about kindergarten early entry and kindergarten registration. And I'm going to go straight to a parent resources page but there's a whole list of resources that are going to be really interesting for you. And the one that I want to close with after Alice has said is one called Broom. Please raise your hand if you've heard of that before. Okay, great. So some of you have Broom is an app that parents can put on their phone. It's free. And it comes in Spanish and in English. And it gives parents ideas about Every, how they can turn everyday moments into learning opportunities to help build their child's brain in the architecture. It's really cool. So like just little ideas of how you can incorporate counting into bath time or the, you know, la so language into laundry time. So anyway, I'll show you that um, in the bathroom as Alice gives out some goodies. Website. No, you just in the box. Will be about it again. It's a free app that any parent can put on their smartphone. They enter in their child's name, bless you, and age, 
and that it suggests throughout the day all kinds of activities that parents can do with their kids to conversate with them about learning. And Okay, so we're working on putting together one more session for this year in May, and we're looking at doing it on science, which is, I think, very exciting because we often put that last, and it's very hands-on and interdisciplinary, and then we really want your feedback as we put together the schedule for next year. We'd like to do three to four of these next year, and we want to make a meeting and I know one of the suggestions or requests will be around social emotional development behavior intervention and we will I think we'll do that first so thank you so much